So hello and welcome to our event. Uh, human rights and environment are not among issues that presently occupy our minds uh, yet. These are these are globally pressing questions that should be nevertheless be addressed and uh, it seems that we're witnessing emergence of new human rights and what is the response of human rights to our environmental issues we face uh, today. And today we're honored to have Professor John Knox today with us. Uh, Professor served as the United Nations independent expert and its first uh, special rapporteur on the issue of human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. He's currently in Henry C. Warman, Professor of International Law at the Wake Forest University School of Law. That's really difficult to imagine a better spe speaker on the topic of uh, emerging right to a healthy environment. Hello, Professor Knox, and thank you for accepting our invitation to meet. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure yeah. to be here. Um, I would like to discuss a few topics related to human rights and environment uh, and the right to a healthy environment in particular. Uh, it, our meeting is part of a class. Uh, after my initial questions, I will invite students who are present to ask questions. And as we stream this on YouTube, please anyone willing uh, to ask a question on our uh, on uh, on YouTube, uh, please do it in in comments section. And uh, uh, to be relevant today, I would like to begin with a question uh, that's that's actually. Uh, uh, that that is related to our primary really uh, concerns. This is the Russian aggression in U uh, in Ukraine. And um, what are the environmental obligations of states during international con uh, conflicts? Is it relevant at all to talk about environmental issues during the war, Professor Knox? Yeah, so I'm I'm glad you started with that question because I'm sure it's on the minds of of your students and yourself and everyone. Right now, in um, across Eastern and Central Europe, um, I think it's also important always to bear in mind that the law of war, in many ways, is very, very closely related to human rights law. And Russia's acts of aggression, in addition to violating the law of war, also give rise to potential uh, responsibility under international criminal law. As you know, and I'm sure your students know, there are really two different aspects of the law of war. There's the use ad bellum, which has to do with the legality or the illegality of going to war to begin with. And clearly, Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine violates that. So it's in that sense, it's a war of aggression. But there's also the use um, in bellow, that is the law of war that has to do with the conduct of the war once it's once it has begun. And with respect to that, of course, Russia has been, I think it's fair to say, credibly accused, I'll put it that way, of violating this aspect of the law of war as well, since, among other things, it uh, prohibits firing on um, civilians, it prohibits firing on hospitals, it prohibits firing on um, you know, undefended cities, things like that. Um, and again, there's an overlap here in the sense that um, these violations uh, also, of course, adversely affect in the most grievous possible way the human rights of the people involved. What's the environmental aspect of all of this? Um, there are environmental obligations of states during conflicts. There's an international treaty um, on environmental modification that was negotiated by the United States and the Soviet Union during the 1970s. Both Russia and Ukraine are parties to it. And it, it it's um, you know it, it 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 provides let's say strong language. It 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 says that states are obligated um, not to try to deliberately use the environment for military purposes. But and in particular, I should just quote the language. It says each state. Um, undertakes not to engage in military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques having widespread long lasting or severe effects as the means of destruction, damage or injury to any other state party. And environmental modification techniques could 
refer to any technique for changing, you know, the the environment. Um, it's arguable that Russia has done this um, by doing things like um, attacking nuclear facilities and things like that. The problem with this is it's not very enforceable. So what happens if Russia violates this? What what measures can states realistically take against it? Um, they can refer the matter to the Security Council, which is not very helpful when Russia has a veto. The other aspect of this I wanted to mention, however, is that with the advent of the International Criminal Court, um, there's a provision in the Rome Statute under the definition of crimes against humanity that specifically refers to essentially the same standard. It says Article 8B4. Um, it gives the court jurisdiction over the crime of intentionally launching an attack in the knowledge that such attack will cause widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment. So it's possible you could imagine that that could possibly be the basis for um, an action before the, the International Criminal Court. And it's noteworthy in this respect that the chief prosecutor of the court visited Ukraine already and has, and has said that the actions in Ukraine um, you know, that basically this will be part of what he's investigating. I'm sorry, that he's investigating all of the actions in Ukraine that are currently taking place as part of a possible uh, situation that could lead to a prosecution um, under the Rome Statute. Now, is this is this aspect of what Russia is doing at the moment the most important? I, I think I would say not, obviously. There's other, other ways in which it's violating the law of war that may be more... Um, likely to give rise to potential prosecutions later. And of course, the potential for prosecutions later does not help the people who are currently suffering the effects of the attack. But but I wanted to be able to answer your question just to say that that there is there at least are some norms that in principle could be used uh, to apply to this particular situation of causing environmental harm in the context of a military conflict. Uh -huh. It seems there are so many, uh, so so many norms and so many uh, standards that 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 are allegedly violated. That there there are going to be at a lot of lit litigation afterwards. Uh, I would like to proceed maybe with a more conceptual uh, question. Um, in your papers on the right to a healthy environment, you underline the distinction between ecocentric and anthropocentric rights. And it seems that when we talk about human rights, it's uh, it's it's something called the humankind, and we should be focused on on the humankind kind's uh, kind of uh, satisfaction here. Why why ecocentric rights uh, emerged as a concept right now? Well, I think. So I think many environmentalists feel that a completely human-centered approach to environmental protection leaves something out. That is, they believe that the environment and components, elements of the environment, have independent significance, independent, um, let's say, justifications for being that don't depend simply on how useful or beautiful they are uh, in the eyes of human beings. And so for them, they like the idea of rights of nature, ecocentric rights, because they capture this idea that again, components of the environment, and they may be animals, they may be entire species, they may be rivers or mountains for that matter, that these components should be recognized as having intrinsic value themselves apart from the value that human beings assign them. Mm. Do, do you, do you, uh, I understand correctly that if, if, for example, we indicate that, uh, that a certain ob object of nature has a particular right, so humans are kind of the agents of this uh, object acting on behalf of it, it like, like in practice, I, I try to imagine. Well, that's the big question, right? So how do we know who gets to speak on behalf of a river if we give the river yeah. a right? If we say the river has personhood, the river should be treated as if it's a person for the purpose of exercising rights. Well, the river can't speak for itself, at least not in any language we can easily understand. And so we have to be able to 
essentially assign some human agent, as you said, and tell them and others that this human agent will speak on behalf of the river. Let me give you a specific example where that's been done. In New Zealand, several years ago, um, the government agreed with the Maori people, uh, uh, indigenous, the indigenous people of New Zealand, they agreed with the local ethnic group, a local tribe of the Maori people to essentially create personhood. The agreement recognizes the personhood of a river ecosystem. And it assigns a representative of the Maori people as well as a representative of the government to essentially speak on behalf of the river and to be able to take actions on behalf of the river. It also spells out in some detail what the rights of the river are. The advantage I see from that approach is that when you're when you're dealing with indigenous people who have a long-standing cultural and spiritual relationship in their own um, history with a particular component of the environment, well, that gives you something to look at to say, okay, well, now these are the logical humans to speak on behalf of this because they're the ones that are most invested in it. They're the ones that most firmly believe that it has independent significance. There is a danger, I think, if you don't have an, a people like that, if you don't have some human beings that have that relationship, there's a danger that if you simply leave it up to the government, the government may not, uh, let's say, be the most trustworthy always agent on behalf of preserving the ecosystem. The government might decide that what the river would really like is a nice dam, that that would really be what you know the, gov the, the government might say the river needs at the moment. But, but fundamentally, there's always going to be this problem of trying to imagine what a non-human entity wants or should have. It's, we're always trying to use a, essentially a human framework and, and use that to apply to something that's fundamentally not human at all. And so there's always going to be this gap to try to overcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's like it seems that this is like a corporation. So it's like a, something like an ar artificial social contracts, you know, and 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 we are we are we are creating some fictional uh, entity. Yeah, and and uh, are there any examples uh, in the United States with uh, uh, native? Uh, Americans uh, who are who who could be maybe thinking about uh, such such concepts as in New Zealand. Oh, there are definitely people in the United States that like this idea, and in some very limited ways, it has been put into place, but not in a not in a very broad or widespread or mainstream approach. Um, and I think that's true of many countries around the world. It's it's it has been proposed in a number of different countries, and in some countries, a few countries, it's even written into the country's constitution or basic law. The two most important countries in that respect are Bolivia and Ecuador, both of which recognize that nature has rights um, as a matter of national law. But again, as a matter of international law, the focus has been much more on human rights to the environment rather than rights of the environment um, that humans would then be obligated to try and fulfill. Yeah. Uh, let's move on. Maybe uh, as you are one of the proponents of a right to a healthy environment, it it would be really interesting to know what what was the reason you became so interested in this right and maybe you could share some of your personal professional uh, path to the to the current uh, moment yeah i'm happy to do that um so i'll go all the way back to when i was in law school when i was in law school i was interested in both human rights and i was interested in the environment but I have to say that I did not really foresee that I would have a career that would bring them both together. I just liked them both. I was interested in, in them both separately. When I went to work, my first real job out of law school was to work at the U.S. Department of State as a attorney on international legal issues. And I was 
this was the late 80s to mid 90s, so quite a while ago now, but I was fortunate to be able to work on both issues, but in different offices at different times, because again, there really wasn't this idea of overlap between the two. So I worked for a couple of years on international human rights issues, and I worked for another couple of years on international environmental issues, but again, without really much overlap. In fact, when I was working on international human rights issues, one of the proposals before the United Nations at the time was to consider recognizing the human right to a healthy environment. And I had the portfolio on that. I had the file. And I've always joked that the file was very thin because the US position was basically just, there is no human right to a healthy environment. There's nothing more to say about it. So I continued after I left the State Department to work on both issues, but again, at different times and and separately, it really wasn't until I had been uh, in academia for some time as a professor that I really began to study how the two could work together. And I began, and now we're maybe 15 years or so ago, I began to do pro bono work for the government of the Maldives. The Maldives, as your students may well already know, is a small island state in the Indian Ocean that's extremely um, at risk as a result of climate change. So they were interested in trying to make a human rights argument to the United Nations that what they were, the effects they were facing from climate change were violating the human rights of the Maldivians. And so I began to help them make that argument. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized there's actually a lot of things that human rights can say about the environment. Um, and in many countries and many different forums around the world, people were starting to make those arguments, in some cases quite successfully. So after my work with the Maldives, um, it kind of led naturally to my position at the United Nations. The Maldives was one of the proponents at the United Nations, not only of applying human rights to climate change, but of studying how it applied to the entire environment. So I applied when they decided, when the Human Rights Council of the United Nations decided to create this new position on human rights and the environment, I applied for it um, and got it. And so I spent the next six years from 2012 to 2018 studying it. So mm -hmm. there were two, I mean, to, to kind of finish the, how we got to the right to help the environment. When I first began to work on this issue for the United Nations, I was really struck by how much other rights have been used in the environmental context. Um, in the European Court of Human Rights, for example, there was a strong case law on the right to life under Article 2 and the right to private and family life under Article 8. Other regional human rights tribunals had similarly built up an environmental jurisprudence, but not based on a human right to a healthy environment. But at the national level, many, many countries, over 100 countries had adopted it into their national law. So my last report, after six years of studying this and issuing reports to the United Nations and visiting different countries, in my very last report to the council in 2018, I proposed that the United Nations should finally join what many other countries had already done at the national level and at the regional level and recognize the right to a healthy environment, not to start from the beginning, not to start over, but to try to recognize and bring together this extremely, um, energetic and, and rapidly expanding uh, area of environmental human rights law. And so that finally happened. Um, my successor, the current special rapporteur, David Boyd, was a huge, has been a huge proponent of this. Um, and uh, he and, and, and others um, succeeded in convincing the Human Rights Council in October of last year, October 2021, to finally recognize the human right to help the environment. So it's I've gotten to see all of this happen from a very, um, you know, from a front row seat, as they say, and it's been, it's really been remarkable to watch, uh, to watch how, how much has changed over the last 20 years on this. Wow, that's, that's a really, that's, that sounds really exciting. Yeah, uh, my, my somehow re related question would be more maybe general, uh, when you teach and you work in the human rights field, could you could you imagine that the the human rights expert or human rights lawyer 
is not a proponent of, of some particular rights. How we distinguish between like neutral view on human rights and could we distinguish right. it, it? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I I mean, I think it would be difficult to call yourself a human rights lawyer if you didn't really believe in any human rights, <laughs> because then what are you really doing? You could still call yourself a lawyer, but I don't think it would make sense to call yourself a human rights lawyer. But there is, I think, um, I think you can very much be a human rights lawyer and feel that human rights have to have limits, that not every good human interest or goal should be characterized as a right. And even with respect to existing rights, not every single interference with those rights by every single possible person or entity amounts to a violation of the law. I mean, in other words, you have to be to be a human rights lawyer, I think you do have to still be rigorous in your application of rights. And I think in that way, you're actually doing, you're, 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 you're a better proponent of human rights if you, if you uh, only apply human rights in a kind of strict um, sense, because in that sense, you're building up the, the power of the law. If you, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you treat anything bad that happens anywhere as a violation of somebody's human right, then eventually you're you're making the whole concept so fuzzy and foggy yeah. that it becomes meaningless. So there has to be some things you say aren't human rights. And honestly, from if I go back to the beginning of my career at the State Department, that's how I felt about the right to a healthy environment. I had to really be convinced that it made sense to add this as a right, because I, I do think there's a danger in trying to expand it out too broadly. And so I'm I'm sympathetic to people who still feel, well, why are we adding this as a new human right? Because I used to feel that way too. My argument on that is ultimately human rights are what the peoples of the world say they are. And most people of the world have, you know, voted with their feet, so to speak, on this. They have accepted this as a right. They've written it into their national laws, their regional laws. And there's now again the body of law and practice saying what it is. But that's why I'm still a little leery, a little cautious about things like rights of nature, because until it has that kind of track record, until it has that history, I, I think we should be careful about rushing into recognizing new human rights or new rights of things that aren't even humans. Mm. <laughs> uh, if we proceed uh, to talk a, a little bit about the particular right to a healthy environment, could you could you define the the scope of this right? Because it seems that this is a really broad right. It's potentially extremely broad. Um, I remember when I first became appointed to this position, and after 2012 and 2012 and 2013, one of the challenges was to try to decide what not to talk about. Because if you have a mandate on human rights and the environment. It could really talk, you could talk about almost anything in one or the other of those two areas. At least that was my concern. Um, I think the body of environmental human rights law as it has developed, though, is much more manageable than that. I think there are essentially three types of obligations that states have under human rights law in relation to the environment. One set of obligations is what I've called procedural obligations. That is obligations like providing information about environmental matters, making it public, making sure that people in a jurisdiction, in a country, let's say, have the ability to participate in decision-making that affects the environment, having the ability to have access to remedies for violations of the rights relating to the environment, those three rights, information, participation, and access to remedy, are sometimes called the access rights, or um, a shorthand uh, name for them sometimes is just environmental democracy. And again, as your students may well know already, in Europe, they are codified in the Aarhus Convention, which was yeah. adopted in 1998. Just, I guess, four years ago now, Latin American and Caribbean countries adopted a very similar agreement called the Escazú Agreement, which also codifies these, these rights. In addition, I, I would emphasize in this procedural basket, I would emphasize the importance of rights of, of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of association. So that's one basket, the procedural rights. There's another basket 
which is, let's say, substantive obligations relating to the environment. And there, states have been, um, I, I'm sorry, human rights bodies have been more, uh, they have given states more discretion. No one expects Germany and Ghana to have exactly the same level of uh, air quality standards, for example. So here, there's more room for states to strike a balance, but at the same time, human rights bodies have said the balance has to be the result of a process that, again, allowed affected people to participate. It can't put too many burdens on any one group. Very often what happens is that the environmental, the level of environmental protection often is felt in a discriminatory way. Marginalized people are affected much worse. That is, you decide to put the the worst toxic pollution in the area where the most marginalized part of your society is. So that's human rights law says you can't do that. And in general, that would, I would say, be the third basket. That is this obligation of non-discrimination and protecting those who are most at risk. So I think those three ideas, procedural obligations, substantive obligations, and rights of non-discrimination, um, I think that gives more shape and scope uh, limits the scope of the right to a healthy environment. That's that's really interesting because now now it, it's like uh, yeah it, you just told us about the the framework of this right and 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 now we can think about it, to what extent which element could it could be actually achieved. This is really interesting. I was wondering when I was reading your uh, papers about the particular elements of of this right, uh, if of this right that that could be a little bit uh, more com complicated than others, and and one of them it seems to me is a climate change issue, and I and I have a feeling that 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 if we if if we somehow exclude climate change from the discussion, it would be much easier to to include uh, uh, the human right to a healthy environment in the universal catalogs. What well, what do you think about it? Well, I think it's I think you're right in the sense that um, at the beginning, I would say ten or fifteen years ago, when countries like the Maldives were first interested in trying to get the United Nations to pay more attention to this. They decided that, that it would be less controversial if they created a new mandate on human rights and the environment than if they tried to create one on human rights and climate change. But mm -hmm. that's changed. A lot has changed in the last 10 or 15 years. In fact, at the same Human Rights Council session that adopted or recognized the right to help the environment, they also created a new mandate for a special rapporteur on human rights and climate change. So countries have become more comfortable with the idea that a human rights approach to climate change um, may be valuable. Now, still, there are certainly complicated questions about that. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between two types of issues. One is countries clearly have obligations under human rights law to help their own people adapt to climate change, just as they would have obligations to help them under human rights law adapt and respond to any kind of foreseeable disaster, whether it's their fault or not. I mean, again, there's European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence, for example, involving things like mudslides. Um, if there's a foreseeable risk of a mudslide and the government knows about it, then it should put the people at risk on notice. It should do what it can to try and protect them. That's, that's, that's fairly straightforward. And it's fairly easy to apply that in the climate change context. And it's not very controversial. What is more controversial is to say, okay, so what obligations do you have under human rights law to reduce your emissions, to mm -hmm. mitigate the harm, not just adapt to it, but to mitigate it? And there, it's very interesting. There's been a lot of litigation in recent years on this. The most famous case of this nature is the Urgenda case in the Netherlands, in which the plaintiffs successfully argued all the way up to the Dutch Supreme Court that in order to protect the rights to life and to private and family life under the European Convention of Human Rights, the government of the Netherlands had to do more to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you might ask, how do you know how much the government is supposed to do when you're dealing with a global problem? And what the court did is something I think that makes a lot of sense and that uh, I think other courts are doing as well, 
it took what the government itself had said it should be doing. In other words, it yeah. looked at the government's own statements and, and said, we're not relying on the plaintiffs to tell us this. We're, we're looking at what you said has to happen. But we notice that you're not actually doing it. You're not taking the steps that you said you're supposed to be taking. So they held the government to its own standard. That's a very interesting, I think, um, approach for courts to take. And if human rights law, again, as I said, human rights law tends to say, look, you have some discretion societies to strike your own balance. But once you've struck the balance, you shouldn't ignore it. You should actually do what you can to implement it and carry it out. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that proceeds if other cases follow in the footsteps of Virginia. Uh, what about the, the position of the United States government? Uh, did it change during the years? What is the current uh, approach? On human rights and the environment generally? Or? Yeah, yeah on, on human rights. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It still opposes the right to a healthy environment. Um, it opposed it at the Human Rights Council, although it did not have a vote because it's at the time it was not a member. Um, and I am doing my best to try and change their minds. <laughs> but, and I would say that there is a division of opinion within the government on this. But in some ways, they're still stuck in the past, I think, where, where the position was 20 or even 30 years ago. Um, with respect to human rights and the environment more generally, though, the application of other rights, uh, I think they take a more nuanced position. That is, they are comfortable with the idea of what I call the procedural rights and the non-discrimination rights. I, I think they would ag agree that, um, for example, that states should do more to protect environmental human rights defenders um, who are among the most at risk human rights defenders. The, on average, more than 200 are killed every year, uh, more than four a week. Um, and so I think the United States is very comfortable saying, yes, of course, that uh, that violates human rights. Governments should do more to protect them. But when I, you know, when it comes to climate change reductions, I'm pretty sure the government would say, oh no, that doesn't apply to us. We don't have any human rights obligations to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And to be fair to the US, I think quite a few other governments would take the same position, including China, um, Russia, of course, uh, but even probably countries like Japan, Australia, Canada, many of the big emitters, I think, would resist the idea that human rights law applies to their climate policy. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be correct to, to assume that uh, uh, the right to healthy environment uh, interfere too much into domestic policy uh, policies of the uh, of the countries and this is the, the reason why the countries oppose uh, inclusion of uh, of this right into the catalogs well it's i mean much depends on how you interpret the right to a healthy environment right so yeah. uh, i think the main reason many countries oppose it is that at least I would say the United States, the UK, Canada, Australia, they have legal systems in which they have not traditionally recognized economic, social, and cultural rights of any kind. And so for the United States, it's not, sometimes they make arguments that make it sound as if they're specifically focusing on their concerns about the right to a healthy environment. But let's be clear about this. The United States isn't a party to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It's not very comfortable with any economic, social, and cultural rights being treated as human rights. Um, so if you're uncomfortable with any economic, social, and cultural rights that way, then you're uncomfortable with the right to a healthy environment because it does look much more like an economic, social, and cultural right than a civil and political right. Um, but again, I you know, this is... The, most countries in the world are comfortable with it. It's really a, a small number of countries that aren't. The countries that are not, however, are, let's say, while they're small in number, they, they possess great influence because they include the United States, the UK, um, China, Japan, and so forth. Um, so that's part of the reason why it has been so difficult to get UN recognition of this right because the countries that oppose it are disproportionately powerful, let's say, in the United Nations.
that's really interesting to talk uh, to talk about the the reasons why why the countries oppose it and and uh, like it one of the probably last of my questions before we 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 open the discussion would it would be probably if we imagine in a hypothetical situation that we uh, recognize the right to a healthy environment what would this recognition the formal recognition in some uh, basic universal human rights catalog uh, imply uh, to the human rights system well, I think one interesting aspect of it would be that it would be, um, I mean, let me put it this way. It, as I said, it's already been recognized by many, I mean, really most countries. If that had been the case in 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being drafted, it's extremely difficult for me to imagine that this right would not have been included because the drafters of the Universal Declaration looked for their inspiration at what national constitutions and national laws already recognized. The reason why this right wasn't included wasn't that they thought about it and rejected it. It's simply that people weren't thinking about environmental issues in the late 1940s. The modern environmental movement had not arisen. So I think one, in that way, I think adding it is completely consistent with the way in which international human rights law has, has always been seen as, again, reflecting what most countries in the world regard as the fundamental human rights. But I want to say another thing about that, which is that one of the criticisms of international human rights law historically has been that in 1948, when the Universal Declaration that recognized all of these rights was adopted, the United Nations was really a small club, relatively speaking. African countries were still being dominated by their uh, colonial, you know, by the colonial powers that that had um, that had that had taken them over and was speaking on their behalf, but not really speaking on their behalf. Um, you know, so the, uh, there's a criticism then of, of the Universal Declaration as being essentially a product of the dominant powers at the time and not really reflecting, let's say, a global vision. I don't agree with that completely, but there's certainly some truth to it. The interesting thing about this right is it did not follow that path. I mean, this is not a right that that came out of Western Europe and that in North America and then was imposed on everybody else somehow. This is a right that really was adopted first in Africa and Latin America and then has spread around the world, um, including some early adopters, certainly included some European countries. But the countries that are resisting it are some of the most powerful countries in the world. So in, I think it would be in some ways a healthy thing for human rights law mm. to recognize this right that's a kind of a bottom-up right so clearly instead of a, a top-down right as some of the rights again in human rights law have, have sometimes been accused with some justification of being. So in that sense I think again it would be a healthy thing for human rights as well as a hopefully a healthy thing for the environment um, for the United Nations uh, to recognize the human right to a healthy environment. Oh yeah, let's let's hope it will happen. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, your 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 responses are, are really and enriching to to my questions, and and I would like to open a, um, a floor for for a students. If if someone would like to to ask a question, I really encourage you. We we still have a few minutes left. Uh, please raise your your hand, and I will. Uh, and you can ask uh, anything you want about uh, about uh, the right to a healthy environment or international law, international human rights. Uh, uh, if not, <laughs> I'm still. Let's let's wait a few minutes, a few few seconds, and if not, we can uh, we can we can proceed. Oh, okay, we have a, we have a question. Yes, we have two questions. I will probably allow maybe. Um, uh, maybe four questions then, yeah. So then we have Ugur, Deimanta, Olena and Alina. So so let's let's start with Ugur. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. Thank you, Professor. Um, I hope you hear me well, by the way. Yes, that's good. Okay. Uh, what I'm wondering is uh, throughout the history we have seen after the Declaration of the Human Rights, Many countries are actually implemented these uh, declarations, these provisions into their own constitutions. Uh, 
including all the uh, all the rights we have uh, now. What I'm wondering is after this um, new right will be written in the new declaration, maybe, do you think these uh, countries will also implement this right to their own constitution and make them uh, more more uh, space for enforcing this right, both for the citizens and both for the against countries, let's say? Now, that's a really good question. I think it will depend on the country. Um, my uh, the current special rapporteur, David Boyd, is a professor from Canada, and he is um, he highlights that many of the countries that don't yet recognize the right um, are not the countries. They don't they, they're not only the countries that I refer to, but they also include smaller countries such as small island states that he has worked with to to inform them about the right and to help them draft possible amendments to constitutions. And he thinks the answer to your question is that those states in particular would be would would see UN recognition as an additional incentive or uh, reason to consider including it in their own constitution. But even in some of the larger states, I mean, I'll mention Canada again. Canada's current premier has expressed support for recognition of the right to a healthy environment in as a matter of Canadian law. So again, I think UN recognition may help with some efforts. But there will be some countries, I don't see it changing anytime soon in the United States on a national level. Um, I will note, however, that New York, one of the largest US states, did add the right to healthy environment to its constitution just in November. So at the state, within the United States level, at the state level, some states are definitely adding this right. Thank you. I think uh, this will be a good spark for all the countries in the future. Let's hope. Yeah, let's yeah. hope. Thank you, Ugur. And then I would ask Dimante. Yes, thank you. And first of all, of course, thank you for this enlightening lecture. It was very nice to listen. So my question would be as follows. Um, we have already heard today that there are now these several states having granted this personhood to the environment. And I believe there were even several cases already related to this with, well, quite a positive outcome. Nonetheless, many countries, there are still, they clearly probably see this detrimental effects on the environment, which is caused by human activity. However, they are still quite reluctant, I guess we could call it like that, to take such kind of step. And they're providing these various arguments like jurisdictional issues, possible some decelerations of business, other developments, etc. Et so I was wondering, what is your take on this? And how do you think it is likely that soon enough some significant bigger, um, significantly bigger amount of states will actually be willing to take the step? And are there maybe any factors that could actually push them to do that? So I think the big, I mean, the short answer to your question, and this is a, there's, it's a complicated area right of all the possible states why are some doing a better job than others of implementing this um i think however from my perspective one of the most important things is does the state have an active civil society on environmental issues because where there's an active civil society one that is able to freely speak and debate issues and also try to bring cases or bring proposals for new legislation or policies and, and have their voices heard, when you have that active civil society, then strengthening their human rights is something that they can then take and go with. When you don't have that active civil society, then it's much more likely that the right to a healthy environment, even if it's recognized, would be meaningless because it would just sit on paper and not really be used by anybody. So for me, it, much of it comes down to protecting human rights generally in order to protect the environment. Um, again, while recognition of the right to a healthy environment can be part of that, it's it needs to be a broader, a broader focus, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's proceed with Olena. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't hear you. I think uh, your your microphone is turned off, Olena. Uh -huh. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. 
Good afternoon. Uh, I just really wanted to, to thank you for the lecture really much. It was really nice to hear from the experience, from the practice, and uh, how is it uh, in US, uh, the, the environmental rights and uh, human rights. Uh, uh, sorry. I, actually, I also wanted to say that as Ukrainian student, I cannot like probably I could just like go through this uh, because uh, now in my country there's also not only industrial in entities, you know, environmental problems, but there are also international conflict and uh, um, the, a lot of threats of biological weapons and uh, uh, Ch uh, Chernobyl uh, generator playing like turning off the, the generators, the radiation goes up and a lot of others and also the chemical weapons were used yesterday. So I think that uh, uh, soon enough we will have this lawsuit also from Ukraine to Russia about uh, about the human rights, about the environmental rights uh, relations, human rights relations during the war. Uh, the war conflict, so this is really also good <laughs> to say this. Yeah. Yes, also. no, I this is uh, obviously an extraordinarily difficult time for uh, for everyone from Ukraine. Um, but I think you're right to look beyond the end of the war and think about what kinds of remedies might be available. One Another precedent that I did not mention before is in the first Gulf War after Iraq invaded Kuwait and then was thrown back out, um, the United Nations set up a system in which the proceeds you know, from oil sales of Iraq were used to pay for all kinds of different harm to Kuwait, including environmental harm. One major component of the, of the um, proceeds went to pay the dam for the damage that the Iraqi army had done in Kuwait. So one can hope that something similar could be set up um, to repay Ukraine for the damage that um, is being done now. But I don't want to speak lightly of that. Some damage can't really be repaired. Obviously, damage to human lives obviously cannot be repaired. But um, but at least there are, this is what the law often has to try to do to try and make reparation for things that cannot be completely repaired. So, um, so that's another possible, another possible precedent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then uh, the final question is uh, from Alina. Yeah, Alina. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for the lecture. It um, was uh, really nice to hear all this compre comprehensive information. And I would like to ask a um, question more about not the right, but um, uh, about obligations. Um, because there are a lot of uh, now legal base and um, reports uh, connect relating to the environmental issue, and um, especially uh, all these uh, legal base um, like established the obligation of the state relating to the environmental issue. But uh, there is uh, so little information uh, about the duties of the citizens. Like um, it's um, maybe enshrined in the uh, local, uh, local national legislation, but there isn't so much information uh, in the international level, and I would I just wondering your view. What do you think it would be relevant to like create maybe some um, international legal base that uh, would uh, establish the obligations of the citizens of the people relating to the environmental issue? Now that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. So you're absolutely right that international human rights law is really aimed at defining obligations of states primarily. There are a few exceptions. I mean, there are a few additional obligations directed at individuals. They mainly consist in international criminal law, which, as we discussed earlier, overlaps somewhat with international human rights law. But there are many, many obligations that could apply to individuals and to legal persons like corporations in particular. Let me take those separately just very briefly. So on individuals, human rights law has been reluctant to say at the international level what duties individuals have. There's a fear that if you start to define duties of individuals, that will be used by the state to, let's say, limit its own obligations. If the, the, the states that have been most interested in trying to include duties at the international level on individuals seem pretty clearly to be interested in doing that to relax their own, to, to 
to be able to say, well, we have obligations, but so do you. So if you don't fulfill your obligations, we don't have to fulfill ours. Obviously a dangerous path to go down. But obviously at the domestic level, individuals are subject to all kinds of duties, including in the environmental context. Corporations, however, are a different story. Corporations, there is an increasing effort to try to bring human rights law standards to bear on corporations. In 2011, the United Nations Human Rights Council endorsed the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which basically say all businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights and set out some corollary obligations in that respect. But that is being increasingly applied in the environmental context. Um, businesses are increasingly being put under scrutiny, under pressure to show how they are addressing human rights issues, including in their environmental policies. Um, and I think that's a very positive step forward, but we still have a long way to go on that. I mean, I would just note that in Europe in particular, there have been a number of initiatives in the last two or three years um, to either enact or strengthen due diligence obligations on companies based in European countries for what they do or what their subsidiaries or supply chains do in other countries. The due diligence laws often include environmental issues as well. Um, Germany just enacted one. Um, I, I, I think the EU, I know the EU is moving towards it, but I, I'm not sure what the timing is on that. But in any event, that's something I think we're going to see more of this kind of as part of this fusion of human rights and environmental issues. We're going to see more of applying it to corporations in particular. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's the right note to, to finish our disc discussion. Thank you, Professor Knox. That that was a really in, if enriching uh, discussion. We're very much obliged that you agreed to be part of this meeting. Uh, well, we yeah, wish it was you my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, and and thank you for such good questions. Yeah, thank you. We wish really a great success in your endeavors, and um, and hope to meet you some uh, some day later. Well, so someday, thank you. Thank good. I would love to be there in person someday. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 would be great. Uh, thank you, students. Uh, thank you, Goda Srikaita, Latushinska, Aurelia, Shernuta, and Vigita Vabraita for making this this event possible. Uh, and I would like to ask my students to remain for for a few additional minutes after we we stop live streaming. So thank you all and uh, good uh, good uh, goodbye. Okay, thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Goodbye. Yep.